Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the episode brought to you by our sponsors at Blue Blocks. Go to blueblocks.com forward slash impact theory for 15% off your order or just use discount code impact theory at checkout. All right, enjoy the episode. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Conversations with Tom. I am here with physicist turned award-winning and best-selling fiction author, David Brin. David, welcome to the show. It's great to be, uh, oh, it's great to be anywhere, but especially in your company, Tom, and, and those of your, perspic- that of your perspicacious audience. Well, thank you. That's very kind. Uh, as I was saying before we started rolling, I really struggled with where to start with you. You've thought through so many topics, uh, but there's one TED Talk that you gave that I found really interesting, this idea of outrage and how you knew as you were telling people that the world is in many ways getting better, that that was actually going to piss some people off. Uh, and you ended the talk by saying uh, in the old network film fashion, you wanted them to stick their head out the window and say that they are instead of the classic, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore, that you wanted them to say, I'm proud as hell and my civilization can solve any problem. And I thought that was a really interesting place to start, especially given the tenor uh, of some people's attitudes right now. You're not a Pollyanna person. So what is it that makes you say that we can solve these problems? Well, I I guess uh, the fact that I have kids, I I really have to believe that we uh, can solve problems. I, uh, I... spend a large fraction of my life in the future, both as a science fiction author, uh, speculating, and uh, do an awful lot of consulting for agencies, corporations, and things like that about um, future technological trends across the near term, across the intermediate term, which in science fiction is the hardest to write. Uh, My novels, Earth and Existence, are both set around the year 2040, and that's the most difficult one to write, and the long-term future. Um, the, you know, when, when, when whoever takes over, will look back at us as having been primitive caveman like ancestors, I'd like them to add, but they did pretty good and they made progress to make us. And uh, that cues into one of the best aphorisms I know. And that is your, your job in this temporary time that you're on this planet is to try to be a good ancestor. If if you don't have kids, of course, you can still be a good ancestor because everybody on this planet is related to you, Um, including the dogs. When you look back though, so one thing you've talked pretty eloquently about is, you know, looking backwards over the 6,000 years of identifiable uh, human history, it's it's marked by feudalism, brutality, uh, you know, some pretty gnarly things. So given that we are, in your words, the ancestor, ancestors of the guys who had those harems, um, what is it that makes you, like concretely, what, what is it that, um, is it our prefrontal lobes? Is it uh, that you see technology moving only in a positive direction? What makes you think that this ends well? Well, I, I, I don't uh, necessarily think that. If you look across those 6,000 years, um, among 99% of our ancestors, anybody who who lived in a society that had agriculture, they were bullied by a few males who gathered together and said, hey, you know, if we pick up these sticks or swords, we can take other men's women and wheat. Um, And this led to the pyramid-shaped social structure that dominated almost every human civilization, almost every society. Um, and we're all descended from the harems of the guys who pulled off that trick. And that helps to explain why males have such weird fantasies about things that we're never going to get. <laughs> but we fantasize about them anyway. And uh, if we're good in the things we do, then our women folk will put up with the things we think. Um, but across those 6,000 years of gruesome, feudal societies dominated by kings, princes, lords, priests, um, who, you know, sometimes they had good rationalizations how they were going to take care of everybody. In fact, at the beginning, 
there was only enough surplus to give extra food every meal to a few boys. And those boys would grow up functionally smarter than the ones who went through periods of starvation and didn't have fully myelinated brains. Uh, functionally taller, they really seemed like they were closer to the gods. So their uh, mythology that the lords and the priests and all that were closer to God, it was, it was in cer certain ways, it was true. And they needed those few, those 50 or 100 or 200 boys to grow up capable of, being, of learning to read and write. So at the beginning, the pyramidal structure might have even made some sense. But over time, what happened in this gruesome story that we call history, um, you start seeing that this pyramidal structure had a huge flaw. And that is that the ones at top had only one priority, and that's to stay on top and make sure that their sons would inherit other people's sons and daughters. That was their top priority, their only priority. Maybe a little bit govern well. And the result was horrible governance. And that horrible story called history, that's the basis of science fiction. I'm going to take a little aside here and talk about science fiction because only 10% of us science fiction authors are scientifically trained as I am. Yet some of the best hard science fiction with real science in it is written by former English majors. Nancy Kress, for example, uh, Greg Bear, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, Sheila Finch, uh, Ursula Le Guin. Um, they write really dynamite, hard science fiction with science in it because we've created a civilization that's very different than that old pyramid. Ours is diamond shaped with a large middle class that's unafraid of the rich and, and outnumbers the poor. And in those circumstances, people who go to university, especially in the United States, they feel it's their right to ask questions. And that's the key to being a science fiction author. If you live near a university, you can get the hard science expertise you want for the price of pizza. You, you go to the department that's doing what you want to write about, and you offer to, to take a couple of technical experts out for pizza and, and pick their minds, you get what you need in order to have your characters say the right things in the course of your story. It's a, quite a deal, and here's the even better deal. They'll enjoy it so much that they'll pay for the pizza. So um, I mentioned that the great story is history. Humanity climbing out of the caves grindingly pulling itself out of this morass of feudal lordships that dominated 99% of our ancestors. And that story, there's nothing like that story. Most science fiction authors have studied more history than they have science. And science fiction should have been called speculative history because it speculates about what this story is going to show next, or alternate histories. So it shouldn't have been called science fiction. It should have been called speculative fiction. So if it's true that the- history. Sorry, speculative history. If it's true that the job of the science fiction writer isn't to predict the car, it's to predict the traffic jam, um, what do you see coming our way that we need to be aware of? Um, what are the, the traps that you see set given modern life? Well, you know, this is why we have these prefrontal lobes, these little nubs above our eyes that are called sometimes in reference to the Bible, uh, the lamps on our brow. Most of the other things that we do that animals can't do, they, we only do a lot better. Throwing, for example, was probably key to our evolution freeing up the hands and giving us the food we needed to become less clumsy. Um, in one of my novels, I talk about how the fact that we sweat um, uh, resulted in us being the one predator who could hunt in the noonday sun. Huge advantage. But um, 
the prefrontal lobes are the only thing organs that we have that no other animal has at all. And these are the organs that let us imagine what if. For instance, it's the seed of empathy. What if I were that person with that person's problems and that person's upbringings? How would I feel? And empathy allows you to either sympathize with others, as we're trying to do in this culture, because we're all, you know, largely satiated. We're able to expand the horizons of inclusion. And this expansion of the horizons of inclusion is the great American project. And it's taking up an awful lot of space on the Internet and the airwaves, as it should be, as it should. We need to, 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 to uh, continue this project of inclusion. But empathy can also enable you, if you're at war or you're in competition, to defeat your enemy because you can guess what they're thinking. So the prefrontal lobes are powerful in that regard, but they also do something very amazing. And it's the key of science fiction. And that is, what if I do this? Or what if somebody did this? Or what if my enemy did this? In other words, speculating about the future, about things that haven't happened yet. And so we create these notions through a process called anticipation. Now, I'm one of a dozen or so science fiction authors who consults with various agencies, companies, and all that sort of thing. Uh, this is the first year in six that I haven't spoken at CIA, for example. Uh, and I chide them all the time for having limited tunnel vision in the things that they worry about, because they should worry about a lot more than they worry about. And I'll tell you about TASAT. I'm going to jot that down later. But the thing is that, that their job is to take anticipation, what the prefrontal lobes do where you, you, the audience member, or you, Tom, you're thinking, what would happen if I raise this at the meeting tomorrow? What would happen if I criticize this idea of my bosses? What would happen if I wear this outfit? What would happen if I try to run this yellow light? And that's called anticipation. You work out scenarios. And the CIA, most government agencies, most leaders, most leaders of companies, their principal job is to try to scope out and anticipate what strategy might work better. So we have computer models, we have statistical models that are improving our anticipatory ability tremendously. And there are some amazing things being developed in the art of prophecy and prediction as we speak. But the thing I keep pointing out is that anticipation inevitably fails. We do this prefrontal lobe thing very badly, maybe 60% correct, when you're smart and wise and you're not, and you're sane. You might be right 60% of the time in your projections. The CIA with their tools and models, they might be right 70, 80% of the time and, and, and get rid of a lot of dangers in advance that we never know about, but they will inevitably fail. And when they fail, as happened on 9-11, as happened on 1-6, when those anticipations fail, you have to fall back on the partner of resilience. I'm partner, sorry, I gave, gave it away. The partner of anticipation, which is resilience. Your ability to take a blow fall, roll, and land on your feet. And that is what we have displayed during the COVID. We've shown both, we've shown the failure of an anticipation. We've shown that a lot of the past anticipation led to um, activities that led to a degree of resilience that resulted in within one year, spectacular, um, delivery of, uh, uh, of vaccines and all of that. And we saw failures of resilience that need to be fixed. Our society's inability to resiliently decide we're in this together, this is what we need to do. So 
the way you improve all of those capabilities, anticipation and resilience, is by taking hard knocks. You get hit in the head. You get punched in the stomach. And if we plan better, and if we have a more resilient society and, and, and try to restore our society's ability to negotiate rather than scream, then we may improve anticipation and resilience enough to get past the next 50 to 100 years. And that was me blah, 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 I guess. But it was a, a complicated concept, and I have absolutely fa absolute faith that your audience on impact theory followed it all. Well, it's very, very generous of you. Um, I want to talk about that, the notion of screaming, if we can get past that. You know, I think a lot. So uh, I have no idea how much you know about my background, but um, so, so Impact Theory is a studio. We're trying to build something that rivals Disney. We um, focus heavily on science fiction and fantasy. And so thinking a lot about, um, you know, what are those elements that you see coming that you want to help guide people through? And I've heard you talk about how you've referred to the culture war as being treasonous. And I want to know how much you think the division is a future problem, that's something that we need to be aware of. Is it something else? You sort of hinted at things the CIA are worried about. Um, what is it that we should be most paranoid of? Is it treasonous uh, division within the country? Is it something else? Well, um, I'm going to take this opportunity to plug my latest uh, book, which is called Vivid Tomorrow's science fiction in Hollywood. Um, and it's nonfiction, like my earlier nonfiction book, The Transparent Society. Um, only this one is a series of insights into how Hollywood has promulgated the memes that make us who we are. And <clears throat> To make a long story short, because you know I go into Avatar and and dances with wolves and uh, Avatar is dances with very 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 tall Smurfs, um, and Star Wars and Star Trek, some of my really infamous um, riffs on Star Wars. But fundamentally, what it's about is how. Hollywood has pushed the greatest propaganda campaign the world has ever seen. Um, and what specifically they, is that propaganda? Um, this is all tied together. We're in an era when um, a majority of Americans wants to proceed with the positive sum project, American project of constantly getting better. We're not satisfied having done what Martin Luther King wanted us to do, and that was, um, you know, provide basic voting rights and 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 the right to uh, share drinking fountains in hotels. Uh, we're not satisfied with that. We have to move on and deal with the remaining injustices, which are very real. Just as he said, we have to move on from ending slavery. Um, so this notion of improvability, that we're in a society that can be made better than our, our parents took for granted, even though they had improved it from their parents. This is not something you find across history in most cultures. You do not find in most cultures the notion that the brightest children should be raised to be uppity and to criticize their own tribal elders. And many of your audience, probably a majority, have a reflex of suspicion of authority, SOA. Where did you get this? We are taught to think that we invented it. You, yes, you, not, not you, Tom, you, you, the person listening to this right now, watching this right now, you know who you are. You invented suspicion of authority, right? 
Wrong. It is preached in every Hollywood film. Name one that you've enjoyed across the last 20 years that did not preach stand up to some authority figure. It could be invading aliens. Uh, it could be a, an abusive boss. It could be just a gossipy mother-in-law. But in, in a situation comedy. But you stand up to, to oppressive authority. Tolerance, diversity, these are all in <coughs> the Hollywood propaganda. And eccentricity, personal individuality. Look at the movies you've most enjoyed. The character you're supposed to bond with expresses some eccentric trait early on in the film. And that helps the audience bond with that protagonist. And here's the deal. It doesn't have to be your eccentric trait. It could be one that even irritates you. But the fact that this is an individualist expressing an eccentric trait, facing oppressive authority, this is what Hollywood has learned helps bond with the audience. And there are almost no other societies throughout all of history that taught this. There is a fifth lesson, and it is the most important one. And if your audience members don't grasp this concept, they should go and study it until they do. And that is the concept of the positive sum game. The notion that we can engage in comp competition with each other in ways that develop a positive sum. Rising tide lifts all boats is one cliche. Most of human history was zero sum. And that is in order for me to win, you have to lose. Most sporting events are like that. One team has to win in order to make the other team lose. This was the case with empires. This was the case with family versus family for 6,000 years, city versus city. The notion of the positive sum game is that I want to be the one who wins more while we all win. Elon Musk, for example, he's giving us access to space and, elect and, and broke through the psychological barrier of electric cars. So we're all going to get them from Volkswagen and General Motors and everybody. Well, he's done very well by that. He's winning. But we're all winning, too, because of those breakthroughs like SpaceX and all of that. People in this civilization, a large majority of them, understand the basic concept of the positive sum game. Most of the people in your audience, Tom, grasp the notion and would be shocked by how few of our ancestors would have a clue what it means. Because we all know we have neighbors in the United States of America and in Canada and the West who don't. They think it's a plot. They think it's a polemical trick, all this talk of, of positive sum games. And it's true in the leadership castes, in our rival nations, those that are despotic. The thing they fear most is that they just don't understand this way of thinking, this new era. So they feel it has to be crushed. So, all right, five memes that are pushed by Hollywood and have been for 80 years at least, to varying degrees. And most of your audience members, Tom, Resent being told that they got these values from propaganda. <laughs> you, you think you invented it. You think you were the first to, to declare suspicion of authority. Or just you and your own little group. And here's the irony of that. Um, during normal times, the main difference between a decent Republican and a decent Democrat is who they think is trying to become an oppressive authority figure. Um, they share, and they share now, this sense that freedom is a narrow window of time 
that could be crushed at any time by Big Brother. And a decent Republican is afraid that the ones, the authority figures trying to become Big Brother are uh, snooty academics and faceless government bureaucrats. A decent Democrat is concerned about conniving aristocrats, oligarchs, trillionaires, and, and faceless corporations. But when you put it that way, they're both right. Male humans, if they get a chance to cheat and conspire against an egalitarian, fair society, are going to be tempted to cheat. 6,000 years show they, will, show they often will. And we are seeing this now. And we're seeing it, unfortunately, in a pitting of people, positive some people against positive some people. Yeah, that, so when you talk about that we're getting a lot of this stuff as memes that um, the reason that I'm building impact theory is because I so believe in uh, film in particular as a medium, its ability to uh, put out values out into the world. You're one of the few people, though, that I've heard talk about how subtle shifts in the way that you present the value have huge consequences. Um, you talked about Avatar. I found this really interesting. And you said, look, Hollywood is doing something incredibly dangerous. And they are making it seem like there's everyone should just give up. There's humans are bad. There's no way forward. And you were talking about, you know, you thought James Cameron probably had the best of intentions. But the reality of showing that it's like the sort of evil men are up against the evil, forget the name of the avatar the people. The Navi. What? The Navi. The Navi. Um, and you gave a quick breakdown of a subtle change they could have made to the setup that would have this huge implication in terms of how we, the audience, read that. Do you remember that breakdown? I thought Absolutely. this was really helpful. It's, it's, it's right here in Vivid Tomorrows where I, 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 I say, and you summarized that extremely well. You really understood that piece. Um, James Cameron had the very best of intentions. He came on and gave us dances with uh, very tall Smurfs, actually, Let's take six berries as given there. Um, and uh, Fern Gully and, and all these other lessons, chiding lessons from the past that have helped us to become better. Uh, also in Vivid Tomorrows, I talk about the role of science fiction in preaching what's called the self-preventing prophecy. Um, Many people in your audience have, have seen the movie Soylent Green, um, another movie, uh, Silent Running, a, a bunch of environmental movies that have chided us about how much we'll lose if we don't wake up to what's happening to our mother world. And I, I participated. I had a novel called Earth that was called the Moby Dick of the whole Earth movement. Um, and these stories recruited so many tens of millions of environmentalists that if we squeak by this period of crisis, it will be partly due to science fiction. Um, the China syndrome, um, probably nuclear accidents would have been worse. Um, certainly um, outbreak in some of these, you know, these, these, these films about, um, about uh, pandemics helped because many of the people who worked on these new mRNA um, therapies uh, say they were motivated that way. Um, nuclear war was arguably, and there are retired military officers who say that it's true. Nuclear war was probably helped to be prevented by um, Dr. Strangelove on the beach, fail safe, war games, all of which pointed at possible um, accidental ways that it could happen. And you may exist because of that. But the granddaddy of all the self-preventing prophecies is George Orwell's 1984, which girded hundreds of millions of people to um, have a much stronger allergic reaction to accumulations of authority. All of that, all of which was prefaced to getting back to Avatar because 
Cameron wanted to do a self-preventing prophecy. He wanted to join Soylent Green and Silent Running and all that in um, in warning about uh, ecological uh, uh, damage. He he wanted to join the tsunami of stories critical of colonialism. He succeeded. He totally succeeded at that. The problem I have with Avatar is that the situation in the movie presumes that none of the humans in that movie ever watched Avatar. I I mean, that's a simplistic way to put it, but none of the people in that movie act as if they had ever experienced those warnings that made Jim Cameron want to make this movie. None of them had experienced the emotions that James Cameron wanted to elicit in the audience. They were all, almost all, thugs. And the only reason that the protagonist isn't a thug is because of circumstances of his experiencing a series of miracles. Uh, the white savior. It didn't have to be that way. Avatar could have had exactly the same story if they, in the first five minutes, showed some humans are really trying hard to do better here. Some humans watched Avatar. And I offer a contrived circumstance under which both those good humans and the moderate Navi are all killed while they're negotiating. And that leaves the company free to go ahead and do its terrible things because human males, human males, feudalism. Uh, I'm saying that if you are aware of these propaganda messages, it doesn't mean you have to stop giving propaganda messages. It means you can do it with a little more panache and finesse. Because as it stands, Avatar simply says, humans are horrible, ugly, and evil, and give up, and we should all die. And it didn't have to give that message. Yeah, I actually really worry about that. I see that a lot. Um, the Where the punchline is that, you know, we're sort of the stain on humanity. One of the things that I, or on humanity, on ourselves, on the planet, however you want to think about it. One of the things I liked about the Matrix so much is that it, you've got the bad guys taking the position that humans are a virus. And they actually make a pretty interesting uh, analogy that makes you go, God, like, do we really go too far? Are we creating problems? Um, But then ultimately, you've got Neo and the band of humans that rise up and do something good and you feel their heart and you feel their love for others. Um, and, And so it's a very sort of warm feeling that I get from that movie. And in the science fiction that I'm writing myself called Neon Future, which is about a world in which humanity has been divided between those with technology implanted in their bodies and those without. And we wanted to take the stance that actually technology isn't it's not going to be Skynet. It's not going to be the thing that takes us out. It's going to be the thing that saves us. And but even like when you're walking through that minefield, uh, it it's really tricky to make sure that you uh, keep the conflict really high and yet have a message that you know people can take away that's functional that gives them something to do in the real world, whether that's hope, optimism, a more specific moral, whatever you know it is that you're trying to do. But it was you gave me such an interesting way to sort of relook at Avatar because I um, I took away the positive side of, you know, not being the asshole that comes in and just sort of rape minds a planet for, you know, what they have to offer. Um, But I guess I let roll off my back this idea that there was sort of there were no redeeming qualities. And as I step back and look at where I feel culture going, there is this sense of, you know, all we're doing is is digging a hole and the planet would be better off without us. Well, I have a character in my novel Earth um, who represents that uh, side of environmentalism. And over the course of the novel, she gets her hands on a weapon system 
that could reduce the human population down to the level that she thinks would work well with the planet, and that's 50,000, <laughs> which is means She's that, worse than Thanos. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, much worse than Thanos. And, of course, she is opposed by another woman who is a much more modernist environmentalist who thinks that, um, no, uh, we're not a plague upon this planet. We are this planet's only chance to get eyes and an arm to reach out to the stars and perhaps um, sexual organs to be able to go out there and find mates out there, so to speak. If you, if you were to um, uh, metaphorically say that the planet is a living being, then humanity and our internet and our society, we are the one chance this planet has to have a brain to think. And not in a monolithic way, the way my friend Isaac uh, Asimov talked about how we would, you know, wind up Galaxia just having this one cosmic mind. No, your mind as a person, your mind is a vast ecosystem. <laughs> You have thoughts that conflict with each other. You argue with yourself all the time. This is the kind of model that, at least in my novel Earth, I present as being the sort of thing that works. Because this civilization has done things that no other ever did. If AI were to rise up against us, the first thing I'd say is, so who the hell made you? It wasn't the Romans, you know, it wasn't the Catholic Church, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, the, the Takagawa shoguns. You were made by a diversity, by a diverse culture that spread itself out rather than being a pyramid of power and privilege. So when, when you say that we spread ourselves out in that example, I don't understand what you mean. Spread ourselves okay. out from a, um, a sort of mixing of ideology and genetics, or what do you mean? We spread our we spread out power. Um, instead of this pyramid, which is inherently stupid. Look, if you want to become a good silversmith, you take criticism on your first attempts at being a silversmith, and it makes you better. I teach creative writing to classes sometimes, and I am appalled by what a huge fraction of humanity can't deal with criticism. Now, of course it hurts. And there are times when it's nasty, and there are times when I say, up yours. But if you school yourself to accept that criticism is the only known antidote to error, cetokate. I'll repeat it. Criticism is the only known antidote to error. Human beings are all delusional. We all have delusions that we nurse. Becoming a scientist, I was taught to repeat the sacred catechism of science. I might be wrong. And if you are taught to recite that, it enables you to use the tools of science to eliminate maybe half of your delusional errors. That's a that's huge. Scientists are pretty, oh, wow. <laughs> but the other half are still there. And the, it's the delusions that, it, that empowered kings and priests and nobles to perform execrably horrible governance of the nations and empires that they ruled. But occasionally, there was a way out of this pattern. And this pattern is very powerful called feudalism because all those guys who were at the top, they got huge reproductive advantages. I think this is one of the explanations for the Fermi paradox, why we don't see aliens out there, because I think a large fraction of them fall into this permanently. But we found a way out and it's called the Periclean experiment. Pericles was the leader of the Athenian democracy, and it was already vibrant and creative when he came along, but he taught the, the Athenians how to 
run a democracy in a way where we find each other's delusions. That's the thing. You're deluded, Tom. I'm deluded, but we don't share the same delusions. So I can criticize yours, and I'll give it that, give you that favor for free. Your enemies will give you the thing you most need for free. They will criticize you for free. And you will happily return that gift. <laughs> by criticizing them. And you cannot get out of this gift economy if you look at it that way. So the Athenians, as long as Pericles lived, they developed an ability to become maximally creative by reciprocally holding each other accountable. It happened again in Da Vinci's Florence and in Amsterdam. And in these all cultures, the, were they talking about it? Were they saying like, hey, we're going to hold each other accountable? Read Thucydides where he recites Pericles' funeral oration. And Thucydides, even though he was not a member of the Democratic Party, he nevertheless gives us passionately Pericles' speech in which he explains 500 BC, why he should have been at the Constitutional Convention in 1787, because he was thinking the same thoughts. None of us is wise, but together, if we criticize each other, we can cancel each other's delusions, but work together on each other's good ideas. It's a positive sum game. And the Periclean, Periclean Athens and Da Vinci's Florence and, and Renaissance Athens were so much more creative than all the other cultures around them that they terrified all the oligarchs and kings and priests around them. And so they swarmed in and crushed these experiments to preserve the pyramidal society. That's happening right now in the West and especially the United States of America oligarchies around the world and within America are all working together to smash this latest Periclean experiment because it's by far the most successful. 250 years of relentless, too slow, but relentless self-improvement, technological advancement, um, generation of optimism and better governance, but also better justice. Slow, too slow, grudging step, one step and then a pause that was too long a pause. Horrible, horrible, but only horrible compared to what we aspire to be. Not horrible compared to all those other 99% of cultures across 6,000 years vastly better than them by all standards. But we're horrible. We're horrible compared to what we perhaps delusionally think we could become. And it's only one culture that has spread that delusion, that delusion of Star Trek, that delusion that we can get past this, that delusion that our grandchildren can be so much better than us, that will wince the way that they'll wince, thinking of us, the way we wince at some of the things that Abraham Lincoln said, while admitting, yeah, he took things forward a lot. So, I don't know answer your question. It, well, we're certainly on an interesting vein. So when you think about the that Periclean experiment being undermined now, um, so we've got the reconsolidation of power into the hands of a few. Uh, what else is going on to make that happen? One thing I've heard you talk about, and you were, you know, for people just listening to this, um, when referencing sort of the political spectrum, you were holding hands and, and talking about how each side was working together in a more... Um, high functioning way in that they were apt to point out what you were doing wrong, but they were doing it 
in a spirit, and correct me if this is inaccurate to what you're saying, but that they were doing it in a spirit of, hey, when we come together and recognize that the value is in the friction, and this is how I always explain it to people, the value is in the friction between a conservative and a liberal, and that either one taking to the extreme becomes, uh, it becomes uh, problematic, deeply pathologized. And well, go ahead. One of them has. That's exactly what's happened to one of our sides of our political spectrum. Uh, it's gone completely insane. Uh, and when that happens, you no longer have this give and take of discovery of each other's errors. You no longer have this word call, uh, called negotiation. Um, you, you no longer have a word that is highly derided, and it's being derided by... Uh, enemy propaganda media, and that's a P word, it's called politics, which is filthy, but it is how we've negotiated adaptation to new times. And politics was, I can tell you when politics was killed in the United States of America. It was killed in um, 1997. Uh, when Newt Gingrich, who still believed in politics, even though he was a uh, a nasty piece of work in a lot of ways. He still believed that the job of the United States Congress was still to negotiate, do trade-offs, and come up with something vaguely positive sum. A little bit for you, a little bit for me, more for me. He was replaced by a fellow by the name of Dennis Hastert. Uh, and your audience should look up this guy, who uh, one of our parties made Speaker of the House the top official in their party, and his Hastert rule declared that members of his party shall never again negotiate with or even talk to or socialize with members of the other party. This was said explicitly, and it was backed up by the media of that political wing of, of our society. Um, and... As a result, politics, the ability to actually negotiate, and we're seeing this right now, the ability to negotiate and adapt to new times and new circumstances was killed dead. And it was that year in 1997. Um, and uh, there are attempts to resurrect it, but I'm afraid it's going to have to be resurrected over the smoldering carcass of one of our parties. All right, my friends, let's talk about blue blocks. Blue blocker glasses have been a game changer in my life. If you're someone like me who is sensitive to artificial lighting and extra sensitive to artificial blue light from a cell phone or a computer screen, then you need to try blue blocker lenses. They are going to improve your sleep. And now there's a company called Blue Blocks who is elevating blue blockers in a whole new way with stylish and scientifically based blue light blocking glasses. Blue Blocks offers high quality blue blocker glasses designed for any time of the day for any lighting situation with three specific lens styles, daytime, nighttime, and color therapy. There's the blue light daywear computer glasses that filter harmful artificial blue light across the whole blue light spectrum. These are anti-glare lenses that can help prevent headaches, macular degeneration, and digital eye strain. The summer glow mood boost therapy glasses block 100% of light in the high energy portion of the blue spectrum and can assist with migraines and anxiety. These are great if you work under intense artificial lighting during the day or if you're extra sensitive to artificial blue light. After the sun goes down, Sleep Plus blue blocker glasses are perfect to wear two to three hours before bed, which I do religiously. They can help with insomnia, jet lag management, and body clock alignment for a peaceful night's sleep. Blue Blocks is all about science, quality, and style. Their products are made under optics laboratory conditions in Australia and come in prescription, non-prescription, and readers. And Blue Blocks ships all over the world for free. Blue Blocks is offering a special discount exclusive for Impact Theory listeners. Go to blueblocks.com forward slash impact theory for 15% off your order or use discount code impact theory at checkout. Once again, that's Blue Blocks, which is B L U B L O X.com forward slash impact theory for 15% off your order or use the discount code impact theory at checkout. 
All right, my friends, give these a shot. I use them all the time. Take care and be legendary. So this is where uh, science fiction writers take on things gets pretty interesting for me as you start to imagine what the traffic jam is that comes out of that. Um, once that relationship becomes pathologized, to me, you begin to have a breakdown of that sense of progress. And I heard you made a comment one time and I wanted to ask you if this was just offhanded or if you really mean this, you said that the enlightenment had collapsed. And I thought, okay, do we mean that literally? Uh, I'd love to get your answer to that. Has the Enlightenment collapsed? Oh, no, it hasn't collapsed. What's happened is that several of the tools that we used to maintain our momentum had collapsed. Okay, so uh, now let's get real specific. Define for people what the Enlightenment is, and then what are the tools, and then which ones are broken? Well, the Enlightenment is, generally speaking, the notion that uh, individually we are flawed, but that we can, uh, together, uh, increase the amount of light in the world. Uh, so going back to the scientific notion of I could be wrong, of, I of could that, be wrong. that friction between the, the two sides, I'll help you with your delusions, well, you help me with mine. It, it, it less friction than it is competition. Look, the, the left has a mimic flaw in that they consider the word competition to be associated with um, uh, robber barons, when that's the opposite of how Adam Smith met it. Adam Smith uh, hated oligarchy. He knew about those 6,000 years, 99% of which competition, which is the great creative force in the universe, it made us. Now, the competition in nature is bloody. We're trying to come up with methods that are much more genteel, like on a sporting, yeah, like on a sports field. And the way you tame competition so you get the maximum benefits from competition, as on a sporting field, with minimizing the blood on the floor and the cheating, is regulation. And Adam Smith did not say take away all regulation. He said the opposite. He said markets need to be regulated so that monopolists can't cheat because 6,000 years is the story of kings and lords and the owners the, of all the property cheating so that their sons, who never did a damn thing for anybody, inherited everything. Uh, no, Adam Smith is the opposite of what a lot of these laissez-faire people um, said. He extolled competition. So... The right tends to say, yay, competition, boo, regulation. The left tends to say, yay, regulation, boo, competition. It's ridiculous. Regulated competition is how we got the spectacular success of sports in which most cheating is caught. And as a result, the audience members have confidence in the thing that they're watching and enjoying, and they're getting the maximum benefit out of that. Well, guess what? Sports is only the fifth of five accountability arenas that harness competition in the Enlightenment. We spoke of markets. Those at the top and with the most money would cheat in markets. They always have, unless there's regulation to keep competition fair and to encourage entrepreneurship and new startups from the bottom. Uh, democracy, when, when there's fair competition over policy, you wind up getting negotiated compromises, you, the public winds up supporting one uh, thing over another, um, but democracy has to be regulated to reduce cheating or cheaters will cheat. And we've been seeing that hugely lately. Um, the third arena is justice courts. Now there, it's very different. Everything is meticulous. Everything is, you know, because they, it can't afford an error rate, whereas markets can afford a huge error rate in order to encourage creativity. So I, I still weep every day and light a candle up at the foot of Betamax. <laughs> it's all right. I'm an Apple user. Um, and the fifth arena other than sports, is science. And science doesn't need much regulation 
because science is the most competitive field of all. Scientists are most the most competitive humans um, our species ever created. They are utterly ruthless at criticizing each other's failings because that's how they get their most reputation points. So you don't, don't need a lot of external regulation in science because uh, the scientists are doing it themselves. So you have markets, democracy, science, justice, courts, and sports, and they all do the same thing. The reason they get the maximum positive sum benefits out of competition while minimizing the costs, the blood on the floor that we had in the, the bloodiness of nature or the cheating of most societies is through regulation. And interestingly enough, neither the left nor the right zeroes in on this, that it's only the combination regulated competition, umpires, that's what works. So how do we begin to sway culture back? Is it going to be through the, uh, maybe that's not the right way to ask a question. How do we navigate this moment? How do we thread this needle? So we have a time where uh, there is tremendous distrust sort of in all of those arenas, except for maybe sports, but that's when I didn't quite understand how it um, fits with the other four. But how do we navigate through this in a time where political discourse is broken, social media just lets people um, isolate, the algorithms tell you, show you the people that are basically saying either the thing that outrages you, which is where we started all of this, how easily people are outraged, or it just shows you the things you already believe. Um, how do we begin to pull people back and get well, them on a my, useful path? In my novel, Earth, and this was 1990, I had web pages before there was a web uh, in that volume. The, um, I talked about how in the future people would become addicted to little Nuremberg rallies, little chambers, echo chambers, where they could hear the same thing um, that they agree with. And this human flaw has been exploited by the enemies of the Enlightenment, by the enemies of our civilization, by des foreign despots, by ex communists uh, who use exactly the same methods and exactly the same guys as they did back when they were um, communists and as they did as their grandfathers did under the czar. Um, and those among the rich, not all of them, who want to conspire to be lords again. Um, this, we've been egged on into these little Nuremberg rallies. And in Earth, I talk about, I talked to back in 1990 about ways to penetrate these. And also in my nonfiction book, The Transparent Society. But the thing is that the worst thing that's happened to destroy us is also the easiest to solve. And that is um, the media serving these enemies has taken a, something that is true and twisted it into something that's a lie. And millions of our neighbors swallow this. True. Not everybody who knows a lot and has expertise and is really smart is wise, <laughs> excuse me, but duh, that goes back to, even if it weren't obviously true in all other cultures, it's certainly, we all believe that because of suspicion of authority. We were all raised to believe that any snooty expert who, think, who claims that they know everything uh, is probably not wise and that it's possible for experts or people who know a lot to be unwise. But this has been metastasized. It has been warped deliberately by enemy propaganda into something else, something they never actually say explicitly, but it's implicit in almost everything you get from these propaganda centers. And that is the following. 
Because someone is smart and knows a lot, they are automatically unwise. Now that uses all the same words as the thing that you know is true. But you know damn well that's not true. That's, that's a freaking lie. It's insane. In fact, people who know a lot, who developed expertise in an area, who are very smart, probably on average have a little more wisdom too. Especially when they are sicked against each other in an open playing field and we can hear them argue. As we've seen going on among the scientists during COVID, as we see happen all the time in this society, nobody is saying trust the experts because they're experts. But a burden of proof falls on those who say all the experts in a field are wrong. And that's best example of that is climate change. And those who have been spreading climate denialism, if you watch how they parse it, it is endless repetitions of that second statement without ever saying it explicitly. Those who are expert in a field, who are smart and know a lot, are automatically unwise. Now, this is not the first time that's been the case. Throughout human history, the ruling classes have always taken the creative people and the expert people and cauterized them as what the English used to call boffins. You just stay in your lab. You're, you're, leave the wisdom stuff to us. We broke out of that about 80, 90 years ago. Well, it was actually all along smart innovators and all that got more respect in America than in most other places in the world. The notion that you may criticize and poke and ask and interrogate the experts, but if you're going to claim that all of them mutually competing with each other, all the people who know about a topic are wrong, except for the maybe 1% who have sold out for your media network, I, excuse me, you bear the burden of proof. They don't bear but the how burden. But how do we break people out of that? So I get their... So my whole thing is don't try to change behavior, try to leverage it. So you've got the human inclination is to team up. So I'm on this team. This is my identity. And then you pair that with that whatever you repeat will seem true. So now you've got people who are likely to pick a side because it helps sort of shorthand for them. Who am I? Uh, it streamlines the thought process, right? Over the last, I don't know, two decades or something, we've seen that if somebody identifies left or right, you can now predict with some just egregious amount of accuracy how they'll line up on an issue depending on how that political um, affiliation lines up. Because people are trying to take a very sort of overwhelming, confusing world and they're trying to find things to simplify it. So, okay, I am liberal, therefore I think this, or I am conservative and therefore I think this. So you've got propensity to pick a team, married to, I need somebody to just basically tell me how to think to simplify this world. And now it, how the hell do you break people out of that? Well, uh, there, are, there are a couple of techniques that are not being used. For one thing, um, just because you can predict what people believe by which side of the spectrum they're on doesn't mean that there isn't a difference between how right they are. And you can see this in the simple fact that one side of our spectrum right now is screaming hate at all of our expert casts. We're talking science, we're talking uh, journalism, teaching, law, civil servants, and now they're screaming at the so-called deep state, um, which includes the United States military officer corps. It includes 
all the intelligence agencies and uh, the FBI and all of that, all the people who won the Cold War and the war on terror are all declared deep state enemies without the slightest proof. Um, because they are almost all coming forth and saying facts are things. Now, let me be clear. The other side of the spectrum has some people like that. Uh, that side contains some people, cancel culture uh, bullies, who similarly, postmodernists, who similarly despise fact people. But they don't run that side. But let me just step back from sides, okay? You asked how you get past that. The answer is simple, wagers. Now, many of us remember when Mitt Romney dared uh, Perry, the governor of, of Texas, to a $10,000 bet on TV and was ridiculed, a rich man trying to bully a somewhat less rich man. Uh, it's ridiculous. The fact of the matter is nobody has tried it since. And what you're talking about is, now this doesn't work on the left because they'll just claim I don't have any money. Uh, but those who have problems with facts on the right generally tend to have a substantial macho feeling, a, 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 a sense that machismo is very important to them. They understand the concept of a bar bet. There are times when it comes down to fact. If you're going to bar, uh, bet on a sports statistic, the bartender takes your, your $100, I, he takes my $100, we look it up, he hands the money to uh, whoever won. There are so many aspects of this war on fact that could be very, very clearly adjudicated. And the way I express it is, okay, let's, let's bet over whether or not your party is waging war on all fact professions. Name one you're not waging war upon. Now, I'll bet you can't come up with one. And but how would you thing. how would you adjudicate that? Like this feels Ex like it would. I like you, Tom. You you exactly went to the next question. You adjudicate it in a way that terrifies them. You say, "Let's put it before a panel of retired senior military officers," because that puts them in an absolutely lose lose situation. Officially, they revere and admire these guys, but they know damn well that these guys spent their lives and their careers dedicated above all to fact. These are mostly, 70% of them, former Republicans, but you know exactly how they'll rule on climate change or almost anything that's a fact determinable falsifiable or provable wager. It's interesting because I think I think you're going to have a problem with the psychological immune system. The the way that people will either try to undermine the process or back away from the process where I thought you were going to go. So in your book, um, Transparent World Society, uh, for Transparent for Society, Transparent Society um, where you talk about, thank you, you talk about the idea that, hey, look, uh, having people spy in on your privacy is not really a problem. Where it's a problem is when it's one directional. And if you've got Big Brother who has a screen into your life, but you don't have a screen into Big Brother's life, that's an issue. But once you're looking at omnivalence, I believe you called it, once you have everybody looking at everything, then there's nowhere to hide. Now, that may have uh, a possibility of being more successful, but like really, really, truly, David, when I think about what it takes to get to the other side of this, I only see, and I really want this to be wrong. This is not me saying, hey, here's the answer. And I'm, I am really, really, uh, I'm an optimistic person by nature. But I worry 
that until there is sufficient suffering on both sides, that people continue down this path of teaming up to antagonize and fight against the other side with a total inability to accept criticism, an unwillingness to say I might be wrong. Um, to me, the solution is somehow, some way, you have to get people to say I might be wrong. Well, I, I, I look in abstract. You're right. Um, everybody has these percept problems. In practice, you're wrong. I spoke to, about how a majority of people in our culture, unlike any other, understand the basic concept of a positive sum game. Understand the basic concept that facts should overrule, facts and objective reality should overrule subjective reality. And that a decent person, let alone a smart one, adjusts their opinions in the face of disproof. But do you see evidence of that right now? I see absolute evidence. I see absolute evidence and the majority of Americans believe those things. I believe it's a majority. I believe that an oligarchy is very, very cleverly manipulating all of our systems to uh, take advantage of their last chance to cheat. I'm more optimistic than you. Um, I think they are in a blind panic right now because um, demographically, the party that they've used as their instrument of power is dying. People uh, fled from that political party in massive numbers by millions last year. Um, and their desperate efforts to cheat right now are, are based on the fact that um, they're going to collapse and American conservatism is going to have to reinvent itself. They're already very respectable American conservatives talking about how to re reinvent it. Um, if, they're, um, if they hemorrhage even one million more members, just one million more members, all of their cheating will be in vain. Uh, and we are in a, in the desperate turning point right now, um, this year and the next year as to whether or not, uh, those methods will succeed. So yes, I am optimistic. It's, 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 it doesn't sound optimistic. It's, it's, but I consider this to be phase eight of the American civil war and it's the same sides. Um, this was a particularly, a nasty one. And it will only end the way the others ended. Can you give okay. me, can you rattle off all eight? Oh, yeah. The first phase was in 1778 when Cornwallis went south um, uh, because it, it, Washington had them stymied up in the north. Um, in the north, northern states, the um, citizenry was enraged and all in favor of, uh, mostly in favor of revolution. So Cornwallis took his army down to Charleston in Savannah uh, on the theory that they would find more romantics down there. And that's always been the zeitgeist, is romanticism. And sure enough, they found that the, it was pretty much evenly divided a one-third revolutionary, one-third Tory for the king, and one-third just leave me alone. And um, so he was able to run wild with a lot of support. Uh, and that was phase one of the, of the American Civil War. Phase two was um, handled by Andy Jackson in dealing with his, his vice president um, at the time. It was a, a minor phase, but it was very seriously came close to breaking us up. Um, phase three was um, in 1852, the Fugitive Slave Act. And as soon as the Fugitive Slave Act was um, passed by this by, uh, by the despicable Supreme Court, um, squadrons of the irregular Southern cavalry began crisscrossing northern states, rampaging, um, breaking down doors, kidnapping people, um, burning homes, committing every every atrocity you could think of, killing people. And this went on and on and on 
until the northern states started radicalizing and restarting their militias. And you don't you don't honestly think Abraham Lincoln would have been elected if there hadn't been eight solid years of horrible depredations. And that led to phase four, what we normally think of the Civil War. Um, and that was extremely violent. Um, and then the others were, you know, Jim Crow and Reconstruction. And we're now in phase eight. And it, it can only it can only be resolved the way the others were. And that is by total union victory. I'm not talking about liberal. I'm not talking about uh, leftist. I'm not talking about any of that crap. It happens to be that there's a correlation right now because that's where all of the fact professions have fled to. I mean, one of the parties contains some cancel culture, obnoxious, you know, disgusting um, postmodernist bullies. But it also contains all the scientists, all the teachers, all the journalists, all, <laughs> 90%, and, and increasingly most of the military officers and, and intelligence agents and FBI agents because they're on the side of the Periclean experiment. And if it wins, then we will go back to arguing with each other again. And that's me being optimistic in a very, shall we say, non optimistic tone of voice. I don't I don't know for sure that we're going to win this round. We had better because it's not just America that's at stake. Uh, if this Periclean enlightenment fails, I don't think that's ever going to be tried again. I think the oligarchs will make damn sure, like they did after the Periclean, original Periclean Athens. It wasn't tried again for another 2,000 years. Yeah, that's like, now, crazy to think. Now they will have all of those technologies that you spoke of. See, when, I, when, when I'm talking about transparent society, I'm not saying that omnivalence um, – Look, if we have omnivalence and the people can look back at power, and this is what terrifies the Politburo's or ex-Politburo in, in some of these um, uh, uh, despotic states around the world, they're terrified that the people would look back at them. If the people can look back at Big Brother, then Big Brother goes away, and that we, we're no longer worried about that. But if light flows everywhere, and we can all look at each other. Then you have the problem that was in that film, The Circle, based on Dave Eggers' uh, novel called The Circle. And that is, we look at each other and bully each other. And nobody, shy, no shy person can find refuge. Um, it's a return to the village of old, but not a nice village. The one got dominated by gossips and bullies. And you see this a lot, and it's inherent in human nature. And so if we don't have dominance, if, if omnivalence enables us not to have um, oppression by a few at the top, what's to prevent oppression laterally? You know, by 51% little brothers, because if it's all in the open and 51% vote democratically and openly for a law that oppresses your kind of person, well, <laughs> there's transparency for you. There's an answer to that. And that is cultural values. If we have a cultural value of my op, mind your own business, leave each other alone, have sympathy for the shy and the vulnerable, then who is going to be outed in such a society where we can all see? The ones who want to, uh, you having your privacy invaded? Or is it going to be those who invade your privacy? Is it going to be the bullies? If you, 
if we have a cultural value of mind your own business, leave each other alone, watch out for each other's feelings, then that means that we'll defend each other's privacy. There is no other path. We have to have omnivalence to avoid Big Brother. But if we have omnivalence, how to avoid oppression by Little Brother? By saying to all the Little Brothers out there, mind your own damn business. It's interesting. In a world where people are volunteering so much information, um, I'll be curious to see if, if that's a, a plausible reaction. Um, when you were going through the eight ways uh, or the eight phases of the Civil War, it it made me wonder, do you have a formal process for learning and is it focused primarily on history? Uh, well, you know, as I said earlier, I thought science fiction should be have been named speculative history because actually science fiction authors read and watch on TV and YouTube and all that more history than science. Uh, even me, I'm a scientist. I consult with NASA. I'm, I'm involved in NASA's Innovative Advanced Concepts Program. You have a PhD in physics, right? Yeah. yeah. Which already is crazy. Uh, <laughs> it does make you crazy. Woo! Um, the, the point is, uh, senior moment. How do you go about learning? So oh, yeah. like, I look behind yeah. you and there's a bazillion books. I imagine those aren't even all the books. How do oh. you decide what vein to tap into? Well, you know, when, one of the things that you... <sighs> when I give commencement speeches, um, especially to high school students, um, but... Um, also, you know, at college, I tell them that if they spend their time at a university just studying what they're there to study, they have betrayed their civilization, let alone that's, themselves. That's a big statement. Yes, let alone betrayed themselves. The modern university, especially the American university, is a wonder. It's the greatest thing that humans ever did. And part of the change that I was talking about, where the boffins were unleashed, happened because of the difference in the style of university. If you go around the world, most European universities and most universities in Asia and Africa that have imitated the European model, they have a three-year baccalaureate degree. We have a four-year degree. If you ask a European why, uh, they will answer, well, it's because American students are so stupid. They need a, a, another year of remedial education. Well, in a sense... In a sense, yes, but it's not that simple. The reason why we have a four-year university degree is that spread across those four years is an entire year's worth of breadth requirements. You go to an American university and Canadian as an undergraduate, and if you're a science major, you're required to take a year of arts, humanities, history, uh, and so on. And if you pay attention and let these things open your mind and heart to those topics, you may retain a certain curiosity about them the rest of your life. Um, I'm, I was told that I saw Einstein play the violin when I was four. Whoa. Um, I have no memory of it. But when I went to Caltech, I met Richard Feynman, Murray Gilman, and found out that all the great scientists I've ever met had artistic sidelines that they pursued passionately. Literary, uh, Feynman's painter and a bongos player, um, and so on. 
you can be positive some. You can be more than one thing. How do you choose, though? How do you decide? Like, time is so finite. How do you decide what you're going to pursue? You personally. You get angry at the finiteness of life. I'm right there with you. You, you get mad. And that takes us back to that wonderful movie, Network. If you want to fight something, that's what Howard Beale says when he says, "You, but I don't know how to solve the inflation or the, or the racism or anything, but I know that first you have to get mad. And then he says, go to the window and yell, I'm as bad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And you will give your audience members a link to where I answer that. It's a wonderful movie. It's a powerful message. And it's the wrong message for our time. But when it comes to life and its limitations and the limited number of hours that you have in the day and the limited number of days that you have in your life, uh, that wonderful poem is important. Do not go, you know, softly into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Well, raging against death is utterly futile. But raging systematically against your limitations. I am not a limited being. Oh, I'm limited in time. I'm limited in resources. I'm limited in brain power. I'm limited in all those things. But I can be interested in more than one thing. And so this is what the American and Canadian University did. If you're a science major, you have to take a year's worth of breadth requirements in humanities and law and, and things like that. And what the result was that the nerds and the geeks at so many companies got frustrated with their bosses and said, you know what? What he does is real easy. I'm going to start my own company or I'm going to get a law degree or, a, or an MBA on the side while I'm inventing. And there, all of a sudden you had a situation in which nerds and geeks who are inventing wound up actually owning and running. And the same thing in the opposite direction. Arts majors, history majors, English majors are required to take three or four introductory science classes and some math. Now, it's not much. I've taught some of those classes. <laughs> yeah, they're real lightweight. But it's enough that I'm going to ask you, Tom, to guess what nation on earth always scores on the top three in adult science literacy. It's cheating because I've watched so many hours of you talking. <laughs> I know the answer, which yes, is it was most, shocking, by the way. I so would shocking. never have guessed it. Yeah, even with the linguistic clues that I just gave, your audience members, one, two of them, are going to have the guts to guess what nation is always in the top three of adult science literacy. And it's the United States of America. And we're so used to self-flagellating how awful and stupid our children are and how bad our education system is. But because of those three or four science literacy classes that the arts and the history and the law and all those majors are supposed to take, the average American who's had any university education actually knows a thing or two about what an atom is. So what I tell the students at these talks is very simple. I want you to get up now, leave this stupid speech by this stupid sci-fi author, and I want you to walk to a randomly chosen building on a college campus. Throw a dart each month at a map of the university on the wall and go to the nearest place to where the dart went. Choose a random building. Stand outside with some D&D &D dice and roll a random floor. Go to that floor. Stand at the end of the hall, throw a ball down the hall, wherever the ball stopped. Now you've chosen a random room on a random floor in a random building. Pick up the ball, no tripping. 
knock on the nearest door and say, excuse me, what do you do here? Now, always in life, ask yourself, what's the worst that could happen? Uh, I was wooing a young woman. I wanted her to be my wife. She said she could never marry a man who hadn't jumped out of an airplane at 10,000 feet. So I said, well, Leadville, Colorado is at 12,000 feet. Can I jump out of an airplane on the tarmac? And she said, nope. So well, uh, 30 years later, we're still married. So needless to say, I dropped, jumped out of an airplane. But when I made that decision, I asked myself, what's the worst that can happen? And the positive out likely outcome outweighed the unlikely, highly negative outcome. When you are asked to choose a random door to knock on at a university campus, what's the worst that can happen? Tom? They tell you to bug off or it's empty. Those are, those <laughs> are like the two. <laughs> Bugger off, kid. To which you reply and then just knock on the next door. Within three doors, you will be taken on a tour of stuff you never imagined. Stuff that is changing what it is to be human as we speak. Do that just a few dozen times and you will never be the same person and all it costs you is a do an hour a month. And besides which, it's a good date. It's a great date. You invite somebody along on that in a little group of three or four, it's like nothing she's ever been asked before. <laughs> and she'll be different of you than, than, than all the other suitors. Um, the point is, when I told that story at the Southern China Technological Institute, a new university in Shenzhen, the, the, the high-tech entrepreneurial city in China. The looks, and this was the science fiction club. These were the rambunctious ones. The appalled looks on their faces taught me so much. When I asked, what's the worst that can happen if you knock on a random door? One kid shouted out, you might get caught. And I have never given a sermon so eloquent as the one that I gave at that moment without any words, just by letting my jaw drop open. Because it never occurred to me that I would get that response shouted by a young person at a university. This distilled for me what the Enlightenment experiment is about. And I have received mail from all sorts of people who said they went ahead and they started knocking on doors and asking. In a less systematic and less organized way, it's what I did at Caltech and when I did my PhD at UCSD. And it's how I got half of my education. And it didn't cost much time. You can, it, it's not that you have to do that particular thing. It's the attitude that makes you a member of this civilization. I am surrounded by wonders. I deserve to know about them. My tax dollars helped pay for all this crap. I deserve 10 minutes of your time telling me what the hell you do here. And when I leave, I may invite you to pizza. <laughs> I may make friends that I will never forget. You have a right to that. 
Yeah, I definitely want to live in a world where people are more curious. There's no question about that. David, I think you introduced us to the perfect place to stop. Thank you so much for everything that you put out into the world, all your writing, your vision for the future, um, all the talks that you do, which are really, really fantastic. And thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I well, definitely I, appreciate it. I appreciate it. it, Tom, and I'm sure there will be links below. Um, could you include the link to a project that I'd like your folks to check in on in about six months? It's called There's a Story About That, TASAT. After years telling people at CIA and other places that um, when they find something weird going on, they were, should refer to 80 years of science fiction thought experiments because probably some author has thought through this thing, alien contact, no people coming out of the ground, whatever it is. TASAT is an organization that's going to try to get nerds and geeks to be available to refer to those thousands of stories in case those thought experiments are necessary. We're still refining the site, but um, within six months, I hope that uh, some, you and some of the uh, some of your wonderful geeky audience will uh, will sign in. In any event, you ask great questions, and man, do you do your homework, Tom? Thank you. Thank you for uh, m making my homework time well spent. I appreciate that very much. And other than there's a story about that, which we will link to. So if I just misspoke the exact uh, letters, don't worry. We will link yeah, to yeah, it. Yes. Um, but where should people stay in touch with you? Oh, well, my, my um, website is davidbrin.com. I have a newsletter. I hope people will sign up for it because I'm not a nag. I, I send out one a year. And the last five months has been the most productive of my professional life. Um, mm -hmm. I've got 12 different book projects that have been, I showed you a couple of them. This is um, my young adult book that just came out, an adventure in which uh, aliens kidnap a California high school and live to regret it. So um, davidbrin.com. I also have a blog called Contrary Brin, uh, and it's got one of the oldest uh, and, um, and savviest uh, comment communities out there. So in any event, um, hang in there and fight for civilization. This, remember, it's not about left and right. It's a stupid, stupid metaphor. We inherit from the French of all people. <laughs> I mean, for heaven's sake, <laughs> it's about... Forward. Little do they know, by the way, that you're fluent in French. Uh, je, je ne sais pas, c'est absolument fou. Mais uh, j'ai habité à, à cette belle ville, uh, Paris, pour deux années. Not bad. Not awesome. Anyway. Well, David, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, good luck with everything. And speaking of things that will bring you good luck, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. <laughs>